On today's episode, we're taking a look at the all-new 2017 Volvo S90 sedan because, as promised, we have managed to get our hands on one for a complete week. Not only is the S90 all-new, but this is also just about exactly the same size as the Audi A6, BMW 5 Series, and Mercedes-Benz E-Class. Volvos in the past had been almost a half step smaller in every segment they competed in, but that's changing with this all-new S90. Although the design language is very similar between the S90 and the XC90, it's not exactly the same. We have this smaller Volvo grill right up here. It actually is a little bit concave. It bends in a little bit towards the vehicle. We do have the 360 degree camera in our model, so we do have a camera right there integrated into the Volvo logo. In the United States, these LED headlamps are standard. These are full LEDs, so we have LED turn signals, LED high beams, and LED low beams. And then we have LED fog lamps down below in our model. At 195.4 inches long, the S90 is significantly longer than the old S80. It actually is about the same size as the old S80 long wheelbase. That moves Volvo up from being one of the smallest entries in the segment to being at the top of the pack in terms of overall length. Of course, the Volvo S90 is still a front-wheel drive vehicle by default, although we no longer get front-wheel drive proportions right up front. You'll notice there's something very different going on right here versus the old S80. We have this very long distance between the front door and the beginning of the front wheel. That was very deliberate by Volvo. They wanted to make this car look more like every other entry in this segment. And without a question, the S90 looks like a rear wheel drive vehicle. The only angle I'm not quite sure about is this back angle. We have these very large and distinctive tail lamp modules that go from the bottom right here, curve around the side, and then actually merge into the trunk lid itself. The rear end certainly looks better in person than it does in pictures, but I'd love to know what you think about this overall rear end design down there in the comments section down below. Volvo has always marched to a slightly different drummer, and that's really obvious under the hood. Very much like the larger XC90, this is a four-cylinder vehicle only. You have your choice of two different four-cylinder engines in the United States at this moment, although we do expect to see performance entries and possibly plug-in hybrid entries coming soon. Things start out with a 2-liter turbocharged 4-cylinder engine that produces 250 horsepower, and Volvo calls that the T5. Then we get the T6, which adds a supercharger, but doesn't remove the turbocharger, and that's the model we're taking a look at right here. The supercharger and the turbocharger together bring this engine up to 316 horsepower, although Volvo will be selling a Polestar engine ECU upgrade that will actually bump the power a little bit further. Although several years ago, it would have been odd to see a luxury sedan this size with a 2-liter 4-cylinder engine under the hood. 2-liter 4-cylinder engines have become the norm even in this mid-size luxury segment. Even brands like Lexus that have been very late to the turbocharged party are sticking a 2-liter 4-cylinder engine under the hood of the Lexus GS. And of course, if you buy the Jaguar XF, its base engine is actually a 4-cylinder turbo diesel producing only 180 horsepower. That's definitely quite different than the 4-cylinder turbos that we see under the Volvo's hood. Volvo uses essentially the same seat design in the S90 and the XC90. This is Volvo's all-new seat design, which can be had with an available extending thigh cushion, inflating bolsters, and a four-way adjustable lumbar support. Thanks to the overall design of these seats, I'm going to give these 9 out of 10 points when it comes to my seat comfort index. But you should know that these are not quite as adjustable as some of the German options. Some of the things you won't find inside the cabin of the S90 that you do find in the competition would be massaging seats, anti-fatigue seats, or a power tilt telescopic steering column. When it comes to rear seat comfort, I'm gonna give this nine out of 10 points. The S90's rear seats are very comfortable and we have a decent amount of headroom. Sitting all the way back in this seat, I still have about three quarters of an inch of headroom left. Moving over to the middle seat, we do lose just a little bit of headroom. My hair is now brushing the ceiling, but my head importantly is not touching the ceiling. Scooting all the way over to the right side of the vehicle where I had a six foot five passenger up front, I still very comfortably have several inches of legroom left. When it comes to cargo space, the S90 really surprised me because we get more cargo room back here than you find in basically every other entry in this segment. 17 cubic feet of storage space awaits you right behind this trunk lid, and that means you can actually fit five of these 24-inch roller bags right back here in the trunk very easily. When it comes to our exclusive trunk cover index, the S90 scores 10 out of 10 points. This cargo area is large, it's also very square, which helps you put bags in the trunk more efficiently, and we have hinges that don't really impact the cargo area too much. In addition to that, we have a spare tire under the cargo area load floor, a 12 volt power outlet right over here on the side, and some hooks to help you put groceries in the truck more easily. We have both a helper handle and an available power trunk lid. 
At the moment, there are two different interior trims in the S90. We have the Momentum and the Inscription. We're driving the Inscription T6, although the interior trappings are very similar whether you get the T5 or T6 engine in each trim. And in the model that we're driving, we also have heated and ventilated seats. The big difference between the Inscription and the Momentum trim is that we find a leather dashboard and leather stitched doors in the Inscription trim. Again, you can find this even on the base T5 engine. A very nice touch in the S90 is that the rear doors are put together with exactly the same precision and same materials that we find in the front door. Plenty of stitched materials in our top end inscription trim all the way down the door and very few hard plastics. They're limited primarily just to the speaker grills. The inscription trim really is an interesting move for Volvo because this dashboard is quite simply one of the best looking dashboards that you can buy in this segment regardless of price and you can find it at much lower MSRPs because they're putting it in that base engine as well. We have some contrasting stitching right here, some matching stitching right up here on top. Notice we have a great deal of attention to detail, especially with this harsh crease line that runs right across the dashboard, sort of like a little eyebrow. And then we have a large glove compartment on the passenger side. Now this has a mechanical manual release right there, not the push button that we see in the XC90. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, again, we have the optional Bowers & Wilkins sound system, so that's why we have this three speaker array right there in the dashboard. You can see more of this contrasting stitching and how it matches up with the instrument cluster hood right here. The portrait orientation infotainment system is standard in all US bound S90 models. This works very much like an iPad or other tablet computer. We have basically a home button right down here at the bottom of the screen, and then we can touch the various modules. There is a complete review on the system on my channel as well, so you can see it in greater detail. But the big things to know about the system are that we have standard Apple CarPlay integration. We do expect to see Android Auto integration very soon. And the system is very easy to interact with. We have navigation in this particular system as well. It supports finger gestures, pinch to zoom. You can move around with your finger, that sort of thing. Swiping the other way on the screen gives you access to a lot of functions that used to be buttons in older Volvo models, like putting your stability control into sport mode, enabling or disabling the lane keeping aid, cross traffic alert, distance alert, accessing that 360 degree camera, folding the rear headrests, all that sort of thing. And we can scroll down to see even more. Below the infotainment screen, we find the few physical buttons that the car has left. We have our hazard light button, defogger, defroster, track forward, backward, play pause, and then we rotate this ring around for the volume knob. Continuing down from that, we have a padded stitched leather center console with more open pore wood trim on these two large roller cover areas. The first area conceals a small storage cubby there, not quite large enough to put phones in. If we slide this back, we find a 12 volt power port, a square cup holder, and then two more round cup holders right there behind. To the left of that, we have our automatic brake hold button. This keeps brake pressure on so you don't have to keep your foot on the pedal at stoplights. Electric parking brake, drive mode adjustment button. This allows you to choose between dynamic, comfort, and eco. And then we have our start stop button. The shifter is a pretty typical console shifter. We click the button on the back right here and then pull all the way down for drive mode, over to the left for the manual mode, up for up and down for down. Between the front seats, we have a leather padded center armrest. This opens to reveal a somewhat small storage cubby. This is where you'll find the optical disc player. The reason the cubby is so small is because we have four zone climate control in the S90. You can see these are the controls for the rear zones. We have temperature, fan speed, and of course, heated seat controls. Standard in the inscription trim and optional in the momentum trim is this large 12.3 inch LCD instrument cluster. It's very similar to what we've seen in the XC90 as well. We have our large speedometer over here on the left and the tachometer on the right. Now the tachometer changes based on the drive mode you're in. Right now we're in the standard comfort mode. If we move to the eco mode, then it becomes this sort of eco gauge rather than a traditional tachometer. Between the two dials, we have a large moving map display. And then over here on the speedometer side, we see the road sign information system of the vehicle. It actually reads road signs and then displays that information right there below the speedometer. Now this display is not quite as configurable as Cadillac Q. The steering wheel design is also shared with the XC90. It's a round design with three spokes and we have sport grips right up top. This particular wheel is done in this two-tone leather where we have the ivory or tan inside and then a charcoal around the outside. Although the airbag cover is nicely done, I do have to say I wish Volvo would give you a stitched leather airbag cover because there's so much other stitched leather going on in this cabin, this does seem just a hair out of place. On the right side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the audio system, track forward, backward, volume up, down. This also acts to interact with that LCD instrument cluster, so we can 
move around using these buttons up, down, etc., and then select right there in the middle. Saying that Volvo is obsessed with safety is putting things mildly. Not only does the S90 get all of Volvo's latest safety gadgets, the vast majority of them are standard in every model, including Volvo's latest city safety system, which will autonomously brake the car if it thinks you're going to run over pedestrians, uh, bicyclists, other cars, cars that are coming head on in left turn situations. And now for 2017, the S90 will also detect large animals like moose, elk, and deer. All of that's made possible because the radar adaptive cruise control system in the S90 is standard in every model sold in the United States. And you won't find it in the front of the car in the bumper, you'll actually find it right up here in the windscreen, which is an interesting location. By shrinking all of those various modules and putting them right there behind the windscreen, it actually gives them a slightly better view of the road. It also leaves them out of harm's way if you do end up in a minor fender bender, so it's going to be a little bit less expensive to repair. The model that we're testing here has every safety system known to man. We have electric seat belt tensioners. We have that autonomous braking system that's watching out for animals. We have blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic detection, a 360 degree camera system, lane keeping assistance, and a semi-autonomous driving system, which interestingly enough is also standard in all S90 models. The semi-autonomous driving system is not Tesla's autopilot, but it is the next step above what we see in something like the Mercedes-Benz models for the most part, as well as the Acura models for the most part. This vehicle, when engaged, will be reading the lane lines on the road on the highway and do most of the steering effort to keep you in the lane. The Volvo Pilot Assist System is not designed to drive you down the road solo. The system is just designed to reduce driver fatigue and reduce driver error in low speed crawl situations or in open highway driving. So if you're driving down the interstate from state to state in those long open sections of straight road, this will provide essentially all the steering effort to keep you centered in the lane. It'll help keep you from being fatigued quite as easily. It'll also help keep you from veering off the road. In our acceleration tests, this T6 all-wheel drive model went from zero to 60 in five and a half seconds. That's about three tenths of a second faster than the initial S90 that we tested at the launch event in New York. The reason for the variance in zero to 60 times between this and the last time we tested the S90 likely has to do with the weather and the fact that we're testing this on our own home test track, the same track we test every other vehicle on. You should note, however, that five and a half seconds is actually closer to Volvo's official zero to 60 estimate than our previous test in this vehicle. That makes the S90 faster than the BMW 535i, but actually slower than the brand new 540i. This is substantially similar in zero to 60 time to the Jaguar XF 35T or the Audi A6 with the 3.0T trim. The big difference in acceleration between the Volvo and the competition with their 3.0-liter engines is that we don't have as much high-end oomph out of the S90. It's very noticeable. When you take off from a stop, this really accelerates with authority, and at low RPMs, it does very well for itself, but at those higher RPMs, it feels like it's missing just a tiny little bit versus the rest of the competition. And that's why we see a very small variance between this and some of those other options in terms of the zero to 60 time. But it's gonna be a very small difference. We're talking just one to two tenths of a second. In our braking tests, we ran from 60 back to zero miles an hour in 108 feet, which is very short for this segment. In fact, 108 feet is more similar to the performance trims of the competition. So for instance, a Cadillac CTS V Sport would stop just about as short as this vehicle, but a regular Cadillac CTS would actually take just a little bit more distance. The 60 to zero time in this Volvo was actually a little bit shorter than a comparable BMW 540i or a Jaguar XF 35T or a Mercedes-Benz E300. That probably factors into Volvo's definite safety mission. One of the safest things you can do in a vehicle is try and stop from hitting the vehicle in front of you. And if you can do that, you're safer than if you hit it and had all the safety systems in the world. When it comes to handling, I'm gonna give the S90 T6 an A. That's actually a slight increase over the score that I gave this when we were in New York. Again, I have this out here on my own home test track where I have been able to compare it more directly with some of the competition. And the S90 scores better than I had expected. I think a lot of that has to do with the brand new suspension design up front. The S90 now uses a double wishbone front suspension, which is more similar to what we see in every other European luxury vehicle, and previous versions of Volvo's used McPherson struts up front. There's nothing particularly wrong with the McPherson strut, however, it doesn't have the same kind of suspension geometry as a double wishbone suspension does, and this allows those front tires to have a better contact patch on the ground. The primary reason that you find McPherson struts in vehicles with transverse engines rather than double wishbone suspensions like this has to do with cost. Double wishbone suspensions are quite simply more expensive to design and more expensive to produce. 
But again, this is a $60,000 luxury vehicle, so you do expect things like that. In addition to the front suspension design, the other thing the S90 T6 has in common with the other European entries in this segment is the weight balance. Just 54% of the weight is on the front axle, even though this does start out as a front wheel drive vehicle. That's actually very, very good for this segment. The weight balance in the S90 is actually closer to certain versions of the Mercedes-Benz E-Class than some versions of the Audi A6. Definitely quite different than what we see in the brand new Lincoln Continental or the Cadillac CT6. Those definitely have much more weight up front. The difference is very noticeable when you start throwing the S90 into corners. This is much more willing to turn into the corner than certain Audi models, definitely more willing to turn into a corner than the S80 or Volvo's own S60. The way that Volvo was able to get to this advantageous weight balance was, of course, by making sure that this platform only supported those four-cylinder engines up front. That's allowed them to remove a lot of weight from the front of the vehicle and shift things to the rear of the vehicle, improving the handling of the S90. Of course, Volvo doesn't try and claim that the S90 is the supreme handler in the segment, and indeed it is not. You will find better handling options from especially Jaguar in the XF35 and certain versions of the Lexus GS or actually the Cadillac CTS as well, but this does hold the road just about as well as a BMW 340i or Mercedes-Benz E300, and that's pretty high praise for this segment. One of the differences between the S90 and the competition is the way the S90 feels when you're out here on these winding mountain roads that are definitely less than perfectly paved. The S90 has a confidence that we don't find in some versions of the Lexus GS or the Cadillac CTS because those two vehicles are trying to be very direct, very driver-focused vehicles, so they have sharper steering, they transmit a little bit more feedback from the road to the driver, but for the average driver out on a road like this, it can feel a little bit less confident, a little bit more skitterish out on the road, even though they may actually hold the road a little better than the S90. Out on gravel roads like this, it's very obvious that the Volvo is a European vehicle. And by that I mean this does not have a soft floaty ride like you would find in a traditional American luxury vehicle. In fact, the suspension tuning of the S90 is substantially similar to the BMW 5 Series or the Audi A6. Even something like a Mercedes-Benz E-Class is going to be a little bit softer than this. The ride is very well controlled even in corners on broken pavement or out here on a rutted gravel road. However, this is not going to be as supple as something like a Cadillac CT6 or perhaps a Mercedes-Benz E300 in certain forms. Another area where our final score in the S90 differed from our initial test is the cabin noise score. We scored 70 decibels at 50 miles an hour. That is a hair louder than when we were in New York. The difference is primarily in the road noise. We don't have much wind noise in the S90 at all, but with 255 with tires on all four corners in this test car, tire noise definitely comes into the cabin when you're at higher speeds. 70 decibels is very similar to the Lexus, the Audi, or the Cadillac, but it definitely is a little bit louder than we find in the brand new Mercedes-Benz E300. Thanks to the efficient engine design and the new 8-speed automatic transmission, fuel economy has been very impressive in the S90. Keep in mind we are driving the over 300 horsepower version with all-wheel drive and we've been averaging 25 and a half miles per gallon over a week of very mixed driving and plenty of driving it hard on these winding mountain roads. That is significantly better than the average 300 horsepower entry in this segment, and it's substantially similar to the average four-cylinder car in this segment. In an interesting twist, the S90 reminds me a great deal of the BMW 5 Series. The 5 Series is not necessarily the fastest entry in the segment, it's not necessarily the best handling or the best feeling entry in the segment, but it does all of those things very, very well with a high level of polish. And that same sort of thing is going on in the S90. If you think back to your school days, think of spider charts where they put scores out on various lines from a center point and then they connect lines around. The S90 tends to be more of a circle where some of the entries in this segment tend to be more of a star shape. And it's that high level of all around performance and overall polish that I really appreciate in the S90. Volvo has had a history of pricing their vehicles below the average European entry. And while that's still true for 2017, the prices are a little bit closer to the base prices you see in the competition. The big difference now is that for that same base price, we get more standard feature content in the Volvo. Things like leather upholstery instead of leatherette upholstery, real wood trim, the LCD instrument cluster, navigation software, and the adaptive cruise control are all standard in the S90, but they're optional in the average entry in this segment. Helping simplify the purchasing process just a little bit, Volvo offers two different engines in the S90. We have the T5 engine and we have the T6 engine that we talked about earlier. The T6 always comes with all-wheel drive, and both engines are available in either Momentum or Inscription trim. 
The inscription trim is the trim that we've been looking at in this video that gives you the 12.3 inch instrument cluster, the walnut wood trim, illuminated sills, heated ventilated seats, those 16 way power seats, coated in Napa leather and the four zone climate control. Once you've hopped up into the inscription trim, you can then add the leather dashboard and leather doors for an additional $1,000. That means for just about $50,000, you can buy a Volvo with one of the best interiors in this segment. It is, of course, easy to get carried away with options in the luxury car segment, but I would definitely recommend a few on the Volvo. I would definitely get the inscription trim and the leather dashboard. I'd also get the Bowers & Wilkins sound system for $2,650, the vision package, which includes blind spot monitoring, the 360 degree camera, and dimming exterior mirrors for $1,950. The heads-up display for $900 is something that you could skip if you aren't too interested in it, but I would recommend the air suspension for $1,200, especially if you plan on putting people routinely in the back seat. It's gonna make the vehicle ride overall a little more smoothly, and it also provides a load leveling feature, making sure that the rear suspension doesn't hit the bump stops if you're fully loaded. The climate package and some of the other option packages are options that I could see skipping, but if you don't skip anything and you get the fully loaded S90, it'll top out right around $76,000 for the T6 all-wheel drive model with absolutely everything. When it comes to comparisons, one of the important things to remember is that the midsize luxury sedan category is really expanding quickly these days. We have new entries like the Genesis G90, we have entries like the Kia K900, which is sort of midsize luxury sedan priced, but full-size luxury sedan sized, entries from Jaguar, brand new entries from Maserati, and soon to see entries from Alfa Romeo as well. So we'll really only be talking about four direct competitors. Although I wouldn't normally compare the Lexus ES to a Mercedes-Benz E-Class or a BMW 5 Series, the A6 and the S90 start out as front-wheel drive vehicles, and in that form, they do compare fairly well to the Lexus ES. On the surface of things, the Lexus seems like it's a good deal in the luxury car segment. It starts at $38,900 for the base Lexus ES350, and it's one of the most reliable and has some of the best resale values in the luxury car segment. However, that deal really is only skin deep, because although it's $8,000 less expensive than a base S90, you have about $9,000 less standard equipment in the Lexus. We don't get leather seats, they're leatherette. We don't have LED headlamps, we don't have navigation software, we don't have the LCD instrument cluster, radar adaptive cruise control, the semi-autonomous driving system. We don't even get real wood trim in the base ES model. You do have to option up into those features, and by the time you do, it will actually be slightly more expensive than an S90. Of course, the mission of the Lexus ES is quite different than the Volvo S90, because the S90 is a European mid-size sedan, and it was designed and tuned very much like all the other European mid-size sedans. So it's going to ride and handle and feel much more like a BMW 5 Series with all-wheel drive, or an Audi A6, or Mercedes-Benz E300, than the Lexus ES. Although the Lexus has a little bit more power out of its standard V6 engine, because it uses a 6-speed automatic and the Volvo uses a turbocharged engine and an 8-speed automatic, the Volvo is actually going to be faster 0-60 to 60 even in its base form. By the time you work up to the Volvo S90 T6, it's going to be significantly faster than the Lexus. In addition to that, the handling ability in every S90 is superior to the Lexus ES, and all S90s will stop shorter from 60 miles an hour to zero. If you're comparing the T5 version of the S90 to the Lexus ES350, the Volvo is also going to be more efficient. One of the biggest differences between the Lexus and the Volvo is interior refinement and interior comfort. Not only are the seats in the Volvo more comfortable and more adjustable than we find in the Lexus, the interior is put together with greater precision and better quality parts. Inside the Lexus, you will find more hard plastics within easy reach of the driver, front passenger, and rear passengers than you'll find even in the base S90. The other difference, of course, is that the Lexus ES does not become nearly as expensive as the S90 in top-end trims. That's because we simply don't find the top-end luxury features or all-wheel drive or more powerful engines inside that Lexus model. The brand new Mercedes E300 is absolutely gorgeous, but it's also very expensive. It starts at $52,150, and you don't even get leather upholstery for that price. You do have to pay $1,600 extra if you want real cow on those seats. The big thing to keep in mind when comparing the S90 and the E300 is that price tag, because for the base price of the E300, you would actually be able to buy a Volvo S90 T5 inscription with the full leather interior. The E300 will go from 0 to 60 slightly faster than the S90 T5, but it is significantly 7 tenths of a second behind the T6 all-wheel drive. The price tag on the E300 is large enough that even when we start comparing the T6 all-wheel drive to the Mercedes, the Volvo comes out on top. The Volvo is going to be faster 0 to 60 with a better quality interior for the price tag, 
I also have more standard goodies and a bigger trunk. The model that we were testing was almost fully loaded at $67,000, but that's $9,000 less expensive than a comparably equipped E300 that would again be slower 0 to 60. While I like the design of the infotainment system in the Volvo, I have to say that the large LCD instrument cluster and large LCD infotainment system that we find in the Mercedes E300 is just a little bit more attractive in my mind than what we find in the Volvo. However, I like the Volvo's interior styling overall better than what we see in the Mercedes E300. It just comes across as a little bit fresher, a little bit more modern, and a little bit further off the beaten path. Next up, we have the Audi A6, which starts for 2017 slightly more expensive than the Volvo S90 T5, but it will actually have thousands of dollars less standard equipment. Very much like the Volvo, the Audi A6 starts out as a front-wheel drive vehicle with the 2.0-liter turbocharged engine. However, unlike the Volvo, Audi is using a 7-speed dual-clutch transmission, not a traditional 8-speed automatic in that A6, so the Volvo is going to be significantly smoother in terms of its driving behavior than the transmission that we find in the Audi. If you hop up into the Audi A6 3.0T, all-wheel drive becomes standard for $58,600. That's significantly more expensive than the Volvo T6 all-wheel drive. And unlike the Mercedes, the Audi A6 does not have an interior that can really compete with top-end versions of the S90. In addition to that, the Audi A6 and the Volvo S90 are going to handle very much like one another. Because of the design of the Audi Quattro system, the A6 has a front-heavy weight bias, more like a traditional front-wheel drive vehicle, not like the BMW 5 Series or the Mercedes-Benz E-Class or the Cadillac CTS or the Jaguar XF or the Lexus GS. In fact, when you're comparing the 3.0T trim of the A6 to the T6 trim of the S90, you'll actually have more weight on the front axle in the Audi than you do in the Volvo. And lastly, we have the elephant in the room, which is the BMW 5 Series. The 5 Series may not be the best-selling entry in this segment, but it has long been one of the benchmarks for this segment. Some people would think that the reason for that is that the BMW 5 Series has the best handling in this segment, and that would actually not be true. If you want the best handling in this segment and the best handling feel, that would be the Cadillac CTS, the Jaguar XF, or perhaps the Lexus GS. The reason the 5 Series is often considered the benchmark in this segment is because it does everything very, very well. It has an excellent handling nature to it, even though it's not tops in the segment. It stops quickly from 60 miles an hour, even though it's not tops in the segment. Acceleration figures are typically top of the segment. The 5 Series also offers all the latest gadgets and gizmos that you can find in the BMW lineup, and it has one of the better put together interiors, although again, not always the top in the segment. In the past, you could also have called most BMW models the value option in their segment, but that's no longer true because for 2017, the 5 Series is almost as dear as the E-Class. $50,200 buys you the base 2.0-liter turbocharged engine in the 528i. Thanks to everything that BMW has done for the brand new 2017 5 Series, that base 2.0-liter model is going to be quicker 0-60 to 60 than the S90 T5. However, the new 3.0-liter 540i that is faster than the T6 is going to be significantly more expensive. A 540i with all-wheel drive starts at $58,150. Keep in mind, again, that the Volvo contains a lot of standard equipment that we don't find standard in the BMW 5 Series. So a comparable 540i all-wheel drive will be more than $10,000 more expensive than the Volvo S90. Although handling ability and handling dynamics are excellent in the 5 Series, again, they're not necessarily tops in the segment. That means the Volvo comes very close when it comes to actual handling ability and handling feel when you're talking about comparably equipped models. And that would be models of similar power outputs with similar tires on them. Now, obviously, BMW has a number of 5 Series models that go far beyond what we see in the S90. The 550i, for instance, goes from 0 to 60 around 4 seconds. That is significantly faster than any S90, and that's even before we talk about the forthcoming BMW M5. But those vehicles are in a sort of different segment than the 528i or the 540i, which do compete with the S90. Not only is the S90 my top pick in this midsize sedan segment, this is also one of my favorite cars for 2017, period. This is also a vehicle that I would consider buying myself. If I were looking to spend between sixty dollars and $70,000 on a new car today, the S90 T6 inscription, this exact car as we've been taking a look at here, and the Kia K900 would be at the top of my list, and I actually think they'd be tied. I would find it very difficult to choose between the two. The Kia K900 is going to be faster, it's going to be a little bit larger, but it's not quite put together with the same precision that we see in the Volvo. It's very, very close, it's also excellent for the luxury segment, but the precision of the way this interior is crafted, the materials choices, the overall design, and especially the seat comfort 
are absolutely excellent for the luxury car segment. And I would actually say that the interior trappings in this vehicle easily compete one step above where the S90 normally competes. Again, this is a five series E-Class sized vehicle, but I would actually say the interior trappings compete fairly well with the Audi A7 or perhaps even the BMW 6 series. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Be sure and click that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. Check out those related videos on the side of your screen and I'll see you next week.